let's call this meeting of the select board to order. Um, it's 6.05, if anybody uh, needs to know that. Uh, first item on our agenda is to review and possibly vote to approve the meeting minutes from August 24th, 2022. Um, we have any comments or? I have uh, none. Julie? No, I have none. Okay. Well, then I, I would entertain a motion then. I will move to approve the meeting minutes from the last meeting. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Julie? Yes. Fred? Aye. Me? Aye. Okay, great. Um, in our packet, there was the vendor and payroll warrants. Do we have any comments on those? Nope. Nope. Okay, and those don't require a vote. Um, I've got item three, which is public comment, and this is specifically for comments from the public related to items that are not listed on the agenda, things on the agenda, you get to comment when they come up. Uh, so is there anybody here? I see Judy, do you have anything you want to say? And uh, Doc Prune, you got anything you want to say? Not I, not I, Joyce. Okay. Okay, well, I think we've exhausted the list here. Um, <laughs> all right, so we have one scheduled appointment tonight uh, and that is Becky Jones and Monty uh, Archibald. We're gonna be here, but I think we have instead, we're gonna have to put up with Fran, basically. Uh, Fran's gonna take their place, which- No, he's know, not, no, no. I am not standing in uh, till Becky arrives, but oh, standing can, in till Becky arrives. I can okay. give a little and outline. Then, and the item here reads: We're going to discuss a town composting and recycling policy for events. Mm -hmm. But um, from reading over what you sent, it doesn't look like it's a fully formed policy right. yet. But it's sort of the the baseline, the you know, kind of the the thing that is going to grow into a policy which is Correct. a great thing to discuss first because, hey, that's how the sausage gets made around here. We talk about it, right? <laughs> well, we, we could have probably put together a quick uh, uh, policy document, but we want to discuss it first. We're not entirely um, there yet with the policy document, so we wanted mm -hmm. to bring it up now and, and have a little discussion, like you said, about okay the whole issue of compost and recycling at um, events on town property. Yeah, okay. Um, All right. So do you wanna keep going until Becky gets here? So, yeah, um, so just by way of background, we did a pretty bang up job with composting and recycling at the uh, Whaley 250th, as you probably all know. And uh, even though I got sick with COVID halfway through it, it was, uh, <laughs> it was I believe the first time that any events of and on either town sponsored or otherwise had composting and recycling sorts besides trash. So, yeah. and uh, you know, the goal is obviously to keep as much waste out of the trash waste stream as possible since that costs the town. Recycling costs the town too, composting a, a lot less just for the haul. But um, with the, the success of the Whaley 250th recycling and composting, um, with the help, by the way, of the uh, Foothill, in front of Foothills, Franklin County Solid Waste Management District containers, signs, et cetera, which we can use again as needed including a compostable bag um, and their assistance in getting um, Keith and company and the organizers. I think um, um, the organizers were happy to be able to find compostable utensils, plates and things like that to use, mostly cups at the beer or at the events that had beer and, and soda which proved to be, um, they look almost exactly like other plastic cups, but they are compostable in a, compo in a commercial compost operation. So our compostables, our food waste down at the transfer station 
can handle that. It goes directly to Martin's farm up in Greenfield and that gets turned into compost and sold. So that's a nice loop and it's, it's very um, affordable for the town, let's put it that way, much cheaper than sending trash down to Springfield to be shipped God knows where. We don't have landfills anymore out here. And that price of trash disposal is not gonna be any cheaper. In fact, it went up mid-year this year, the tip fees. So um, uh, that's sort of a bit of a background. The 250th was not a typical event for the town, obviously it doesn't happen all that often, but I think it demonstrated to you that we could easily put in place similar, a similar policy following what we did at the uh, 250th for other events on town properties. Uh, some towns are across the state have done some similar, some of, or bits of it, banned plastics, but particularly plastic water bottles um, and different things. But the state has uh, basically banned um, compost, uh, food waste from the, the um, from anything, from any waste stream and requiring it to be composted as of November 1st. So we're kind of ahead of the curve a little bit, but when we get this policy in place, it would dovetail probably pretty nicely with the state's own goals for composting more and um, throwing away less trash. Um, so when you say food waste, food waste uh, won't be like, that means food waste won't be able to go into our, the, you know, the Waitley bags that cost like $3, right? No. We won't be able to do that, put any food waste in there at all. No, but we have, uh, and I have an example, I don't know if you saw them, but there are these very flimsy compostable bags mm. for compost and they do deteriorate pretty quickly, i.e. compost yeah. pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Um, no, I, mean, I guess I was going in a slightly different direction. I was thinking about like for regular folks who go to the transfer station, I'm not sure everybody knows that come November 1st, they're not allowed to have chicken bones. <laughs> anyway, but the chicken bones should go in the compost now. Yes, they can actually. Which, yeah. Yeah. So because... I, think, I think a lot of people don't know that. So I, I, I hope we'll have some um, a little education outreach in the next two months so that uh, yeah, we're looking to know that. Yeah, well, that's hopefully part of the whole rollout for this for, from the state and actually the Franklin County's Solid Waste Management District will be helping on that. But we've been taking um, chicken bones, meats, items that normally you wouldn't put in a home compost situation in your backyard because it's a commercial operation, we've been able to do that. And now, um, you know, we've been a model. Actually, was, Waitley was the first community in the entire state to have a municipal compost um, option for residents. And we're very proud of that. <laughs> oh, so what, as other, am I. Yeah, so what, I think we can lead with a policy, a little more comprehensive policy for, town events it is no longer a big hurdle to find compostable items for to serve in and or get rid of compost um, since we already have that here. I know Brian had a few questions. Did I answer those, Brian? Um, I think I still have some questions. Beck, hold on one second. Becky just asked me for the uh, oh. oh, okay. Well, okay. while Brian is doing that, I see Julie's got her hand up. So, yeah, um, sure. Ah, hi, Julie. Hi. Hi, Fran. Um, I was surprised when I read that in your letter, and I've looked online and I can't find anything about a ban on residential food waste. It all looks like it's institutional and commercial. Could you direct me to the correct? Well, it's, it's just so you won't be able to put it anywhere. That's the ban. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know where it is, but it's the new bans going into effect November 1st. I, you probably can, let me see if I can find it somewhere. Um, food waste. 
Ben Massachusetts. Commercial food waste. Ban to mm -hmm. my goodness. Yeah. It, but it's part of the master plan is you if you can read that and it will if it's only affecting commercial organic along with mattresses and textiles in the fall right. so well, mattresses can go in the compost i don't no think no so. no no they can't they can't be re, <laughs> they can't go in the trash anymore oh i see you're right julia it says commercial for now but um like we were among the leaders the leader with municipal composting mm -hmm we will that's the whole thrust of it and the whole okay. thrust of the state's um progress uh mm -hmm. towards their whatever 2030 solid waste plan is to get as much compost food waste composted as possible mm -hmm. okay cool thank you okay so if, yeah. so if people in town have a, some food waste still in their weightly bags and they're still they're working on changing their habits to put yeah. that in the compost um, we're not going to be in trouble for trying to, to um, get what we need to haul away, hauled away. No, and no. I'm just not going to be checking in there to see my chicken bones that I forgot that can go in the compost. No. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's yep. So it doesn't yep. necessarily apply to us, but we still want to be leaders on that. And mm -hmm. uh, we're lucky that we have uh, the, like, the commercial composting available. Mm -hmm. for us at our right at our uh transfer station that's really great mm -hmm. yeah and uh like i said the other towns will be playing catch up at some point yeah with this oh, great so, well i see becky is here do you want to turn over to becky or you want to just keep on plowing through no i think becky is uh a large part of this so wherever she is there you go okay Hi, becky everybody. i Sorry I about that. Wrote... I thought I had the link and I didn't have the link. Blah, 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 Zoom stuff. Um, <laughs> thanks, Brian. Um, so, so you were just sort of um, talking about compost in general, Fran? You were just doing general composty stuff that we were just talking about? Well, it gave folks a little bit of background from the 250th, how it worked well there, and that we want to make a policy where we can, uh, in the future, have in place um, composting for all events at um, town property, among right. other yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Brian, I, I did get a chance to read your email. I was rushing, but I, I did um, see your questions about it. Um, so um, I'm not sure if you all got to read my little blurb about um, having basically um, get any opportunity to compost in Whaley that we can and also reduce trash and also reduce single um, use plastics like plastic water bottles any way we can. Um, and it's great to have select board buy-in and um, have it actually be a, a policy on town property um, as Fran emailed back to Brian. Um, so I, I'm going to just quote uh, Fran what you had written because I think that it, it's a nice clear statement. The idea would be to have a policy from the select board that um, composting would be at any event held on town properties and it would adhere to certain rules that we can then um, clarify and define and um, and what what we were talking about doing is sort of having a soft opening at the um, at the um, fall festival because it's it's great to say this is what we're going to do, but it's also really good for people to feel comfortable about it and feel good about it and do it right and um, get everybody on board, uh, which is what I found at the 250th, that people were really excited to do it and completely overwhelmed <laughs> and confused. And so it's good to have physical people saying, this is what you do. And the idea of uh, Waitley is going toward this policy and we're gonna get you guys used to it. I think that seems like a nice way to do it. Um, get uh, vendors to um, buy the compostable cutlery and bowls and such. Um, and, um, and also um, provide water so that people don't have to use um, um, throwaway plastic water bottles. Blah. 
So it seemed like if we could get a, a nice water dispenser and use nice <laughs> disposable cups, I was, you know, trying to figure out where we would get that. But I just, I like the idea of having it be a coordinated effort like that and really do it right. Because mm -hmm. we're a small town, we can do that. Um, yeah, um, so uh, I'm happy to go a little further on, you know, we have resources on, on where to get the, um, where, you know, to provide to the vendors on where to get the um, compostable stuff. And, um, but yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to imagine, um, I'm thinking because policy was what I was thinking everything. I, I mean, what we have set out here is really how do we roll this out and get buy-in for an eventual policy? So we don't have the details of a policy, but what right. I liked from your, um, the letter that you wrote to the select board uh, was that it said, you know, there's going to be uh, people are going to need help to do this. And you've got lots of things identified. Um, uh, and what worked at the way the 250th was having people there to uh, facilitate the sorting properly. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like you've already got like the appropriate kinds of bins and bags um, that those supply, we need a way to keep paying for those supplies. Um, mm -hmm. And we need people to have the foresight to have the compostable uh, utensils and plates and cups. Um, it sounds like you don't necessarily have purchased like big uh, coolers for water. Not yet. Um, but that seems like it does, it's not a huge, can't be that huge an expense. So it sounds like your policy would include the town having many of the, the you know the physical things you need available to people who are putting on events in town. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to imagine like what kind of events happen in town. Um, some events need our approval. I'm sure there are events that don't need our approval. Like I don't think we approve or disapprove of the fall festival. And maybe I'm wrong, but I know there's there's like an event thing where the police have to sign off and the highway department signs off. But those were things like road races. Um, mm -hmm. And I could see yeah. easily having another place where the solid race committee signs off that you're, you've got a plan for, you know, for volunteers and for mm -hmm. getting water in jugs rather than in uh, plastic bottles and getting the composting containers and the recycle containers so that you can minimize the waste that that I could see for events that we have to sign off on essentially mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how to make that um, apply to uh, events that we don't have to sign off on so that's something uh, I maybe there's a way to do it but I, I just don't know what it is um, well, some so, events almost all events with food need a temporary food permit from the Board of Health or health oh, department. Oh, okay. There could be built in there um, as part of their permit process. Um, oh, okay. So the historical be. society gets a temporary food permit each year from the Board of Health. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like for and the um, like the rec committee when they have um, I, I I back when my kids were in baseball they had lots of little events and mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. do they get day you know single day food no, serving permits i don't know if they do actually and yeah they may not do these question. events anymore they may not do cookouts anymore yeah. um uh, my my information is like 17 years old <laughs> um, <laughs> right, I, see, right. I see fred's uh, uh got a question uh my concern is primarily with vendors that uh -huh. how do we communicate to vendors that there is this requirement and then get an assurance back, like, do we get a signed acknowledgement before an issuance of a Board of Health certificate that they understand that they must provide uh, compostable supplies? Because if you have a food truck or something coming to an event, mm -hmm. how, do we, how are we sure that they know that this is a requirement? Well, I know, um... The Green River Festival has such a policy in place so that all of their vendors get, I believe, a form. Monty's not here, but she is uh, partially responsible for that. Um, 
that all vendors at uh, Green River Festival have to have compostable items for their food. So, and they give them the sources where they can buy the compostable utensils, which we could obviously do. Um, how it's policed, I assume that there's a sign off and I, that's, I don't know, but maybe Monty can, and our town, I mean, the Green River Festival organizer is, uh, lives in town. We in, 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 that, in that case, you're, you're all going, they, all the vendors are going through a single organization. Here, presumably they'd be going through, some, through the school, through the historical society, through mm -hmm. the recreation, whoever is organizing the event. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be the town or organizing the event. In no, the right. festival, it's easier because they can put together a structure. Yeah. Right, right. It's all in one place, and, uh, et cetera, right. at one time. Yeah. Right. Well, Plus, but the organizer the there wants this to happen. So the organizers are requiring it of basically people and vendors he has control over. But we need to let the, everyone know that the organizers and then to let make sure they let the vendors know yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a requirement, not a suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not just the vendors we would be educating, obviously, but anybody who applies for a permit for an event with food and or uh, mm -hmm. and their, their vendors. I think if we could probably develop a form that would fit the bill and have, you know, have the vendor sign off and, and or the event sponsor in some fashion. We probably need both in one form yeah. or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess I'm wondering, like, what what are the various ways that, you know, if somebody didn't know about this requirement, that they would be informed as they're planning an event? Mm -hmm. um, that's not, like, for example, I mean, thinking now, we're just thinking about it, all various boards and organizations, like if the senior center wanted to have an event at Waitley Town Hall, mm -hmm. maybe somewhere in our reservation of mm -hmm. town hall spaces, we say, hey, if you're going to have food, you have to have compostable. And uh, here's where you get more information. That's um, a great idea, and, actually. Mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, I'm just trying to think of, like where in our current, I don't know, paperwork matrix. I, I don't know what the right word is. Where is it that we could insert that so that uh, we don't like stumble upon an event uh, and happening at Hurley with mm. you know, plastic cups and tin foil everywhere? If I can um, suggest if we have, I think Amy Schrader, a lot of this is going, going to the town clerk. So maybe if Amy Schrader gets brought in on this to, and Brian, as far as figuring out what, what all the various processes are and what's the choke mm. point at which we can introduce this requirement. Mm. How do um, organizations uh, currently make a reservation? Who do they go through um, to not not just get a indoor space, but a, an outdoor space? I know when I used asked to have an indoor meeting space for Valley neighbors who went through and filled out a form with various details so maybe that's one yeah. way maybe it's already yeah. partially there i think that gets the town hall of uh, events um okay. i don't know well enough about how hurley he is uh controlled and reserved but i'm guessing mm -hmm. that's the rec commission um mm -hmm. so we would need to have them on board as well to uh and and i, I what i the other thing i i'd like about what you're um what you wrote here is that you uh clearly understand this is going to take some time and i think um this the work you've done in the last six months and then what you will do in the next six months with um the fall festival and perhaps other events um is going to get people to the point where they're like ah anything that has happened is possible mm -hmm. so people won't be saying oh that's impossible oh i can't do it um and being able to provide that help the thing i'd be um like long run are we going to always be able to find volunteers who are willing to go to an event and help with this mm -hmm. i think that's something that at some point has to transition to the responsibility of the group that's running the event 
-hmm. but I don't think we can start with a policy that requires that volunteer to come from the organization, right? At, at least that's my thought anyway. You, um, I would like to hear what other people think about that. Well, I, I see it similar to um, the bulky waste day with our volunteers and um, Board of Health folks tend to step up, but also we get other volunteers. It's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but and um, Joyce, you, you listed a lot of potential um, events in Waitley that I hadn't even thought of. <laughs> so <laughs> there's always going to be some, but um, uh, you know, maybe maybe as we train Waitley over time, mm. they'll be more comfortable with it anyway. We'll have more. Yeah. Um, um, so. Yeah, at some point we have to kind of train everybody in a way. Uh, yeah. Certainly, yeah. the people, the leaders who are planning events, um, and I think uh, making a blanket requirement kind of out of the blue is, of course, the wrong way to do it. And mm. I think you acknowledge that in your letter to the select board um, that this is something that's going to have to. Uh, take some time to transition through. I think that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you're correct, Joyce. At some point, the organizer, the event organizers will be the responsible part, people since they are currently responsible yeah. for dealing with their trash and whatever. Right. So it, yeah. They're the responsible people, but you recognizing that they're going to need yeah. help meeting those responsibilities. Right. Um, and then at some point, it's going to be so much easier for them to meet those responsibilities because more people will understand what they're doing. Um, and our our support will be, in, in some ways, supplying two things, information and in some cases, um, the, like the infrastructure, the the bins and the, what was the other thing, maybe the, the, the water jugs and things like that. And, and I think also the information on where to go to get the utensils, yeah. plates, et cetera, to don't make them go shopping. Right. 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 I, I've been trying to figure out how to um, include Montserrat's um, uh, write up in the um, chat and I'm just not literate enough. Um, but um, I can, I'll just email it to Brian and you can share right. it. Yeah. Um, Let's see, Julie, do you have anything else you want to chime in on here? I love the idea of a soft rollout. And I'm wondering if uh, in your planning for the composting uh, for town events, you can put together sort of a, I don't know, one to two year time frame for training and which events would be used as examples and uh, just basically publicize to folks that, you know, it's not going to be a requirement immediately, but we are going to be moving in that direction and we invite you to come along and uh, it's going to mm -hmm. take this long to get to the point that we want to be at. Yeah, yeah, we were, we we're going to um, do things like write it up in the scoop stuff like that so that people know. Yeah. Let, let them know not, not to go to Costco or BJ's and stock up on non-compostable cups. Exactly. So mm -hmm. Tell them now. Yeah, yeah. tell them now. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Is two years a reasonable timeline, do you think? I mean, I Julie just threw that out, but. Yeah, I, I um, hopefully I, shorter. I, I mean, I, I think more like a year, but it's, it's, you know, um, even if it's a policy, it's where it's, it's there's still going to be blips. Um, but I, I feel like mm -hmm. like a year is reasonable for if we have a strategy, you know, like a, like okay. this is what we do when um, maybe maybe two years. Because I also I like the idea of like even going beyond this is town policy to having more information and, and things available for people who live in town. Um, just, mm -hmm. you know, um, as Fran had mentioned, you know, that the, there's going to be more pressure to not include compostables in regular trash. Um, and there's going to be more pressure on and more costs to getting to throwing out trash. So any way we can guide the town individuals mm -hmm. to generate less is going to be good. 
So I like, you know, having that be part of it also. Through, through the Board of Health, that wouldn't be so much select board, that would be like, yeah. as yeah. part of this rollout, um, we also, the Board of Health shares information on, um, and helpful tips <laughs> on how to compost and reuse and such. Well, we have a solid waste committee too, which, which yeah. <laughs> chip in. Right. I see, um, I think I've asked Julie and I've asked um, Fred, but it looks like Brian uh, has something to add. I guess this is for, for, for Fran or Becky. I, I guess my one concern is logistics in terms of uh, food composting. Do other municipalities sort of have a carry in, carry out policy for events? Because I I have concerns about, you know, an event on Friday and food sits over the weekend and uh, <laughs> sort of who's who's managing it and, you know, who's managing that system. Well, the compost area at the transfer stations are open 24 seven, basically. So um, an event that takes place on a Friday night could theoretically uh, be cleaned up uh, if there's food waste brought to the transfer station the next day, whatever. Um, the event organizers, like I said, should be responsible in that case for getting it down there. It's my opinion, but I think that's the easiest way. Mm. Okay, that was, and that was my recyclables question. would have to wait until the transfer station is open, but the compost yeah. would not. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> a good point. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the few times not having a lockable transfer station is maybe a plus. And I think the other the other sort of group in, in town that that deals with reservations is the library trustees at, at the library. So I think mm -hmm. Joyce was the, the rec commission is responsible for reservations at Hurley Heath. And the select board is the town hall and the library trustees manage the, the library reservations. So mm -hmm. but they also follow town policy when it's it's town property, right? Like with COVID, we had uh, yeah, but it's another group we need to get some buy-in from. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, where would the schools, if the school had events, where would they fit into this? Yeah, they would. Well, yeah, the schools, another group we've got to get. Yeah, um, I, I think this absolutely should apply to events at the school. Did you guys all get that too? That thunderbolt? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, oh. it's like rumbling in the background here. Oh. The power goes out here, the meeting will end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree. I was thinking about schools also, that it's, I mean, um, you know, sort of going along with the um the the sustainability mm -hmm. stuff um with the um education with the schools um regarding sustainability and solar and all of that, it seems like um composting and reduced use yeah. can really dovetail with that. Well, they compost already. They've been, they were one of the first yeah. entities in town to compost. Right. So. But I don't think, but I do think they they sometimes have plastic bottles yes. of water. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. And I do think that that might be, that might be a harder sell for them. But I mean, I. I yeah, I mean, there, you know, there are water, school, right? There. right? And what water containers when kids bring their own um, um, water bottles? I mean, that's such a thing anyway. You know, people have. Yeah. Uh, and right? maybe when the Hitchcock Center folks talk at the school, when because awesome Hannah has gotten us like grants, that can be, uh, it could be kind of rolled into there too. Because mm -hmm. uh, you get the kids and the parents on board, and then there's just no mm -hmm. stop. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me ask broadly. I think we've kind of um, gotten a consensus that we need to get people on board. We need to come up with some mechanisms for getting the information out and maybe uh, find a little funding for some jugs uh, to, for water. Um, that'll be, you know, easy to reuse and uh, and sturdy. Um, I I guess. Do you have the sense of from the select board of what kind of things we support so that we could work this into becoming a 
uh, policy that maybe gets implemented on a one to two year timeline? I, I think we pretty much covered all the elements that, it, yeah. that we would want to see. So if we can get the Board of Health can get back to us with a more detailed, you know, proposed set of guidelines, mm -hmm. then we can follow that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great. We, we, we will still have to tweak it as far as you know, which who's responsible for enforcement or at least disseminating the information, you know, mm -hmm. within the rent department and the school yeah. or whatever, library. But I think ha having a written guideline that we can then approve, disapprove, or edit is the way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yep. We will work on that. All right. And get back to any you. other questions or comments um, on. Uh, I've got one quick question for Fran and Becky, completely unrelated to the subject. Oh. And that is we've got a proposal in front of us for upgrading uh, the bathrooms at Hurley. I see on it a couple of dispensers for paper towels and electric dryer. What is the current preferred method for hand drying? <laughs> Good question. Um, it, uh, I mean, it is hair, air drying would be the preferred method. You, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just, I saw this and I wanted to. Yeah. Get, get yeah like we would have three. More hygienics. Yeah. Slightly more hygienic. Yeah. 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 And, and more hands -free. Less waste. Mm -hmm. yeah. And less, right. Less waste. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. Well, it seems like um, thank you. We've uh, had a successful discussion. Thank you for coming, and thanks for all your work on this. And look forward to seeing more as we try to move forward on a one to two year timeline. Yeah, I love it. And thanks for your support. Really appreciate it, and all your thoughts and ideas. So mm -hmm. have a good meeting. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> you can stay. Bye -bye. <laughs> okay. <Be good. laughs> um. All right, next on the agenda is COVID-19. Um, I don't think we have any policy changes there, but I think, uh, oh, go ahead, Brian, yeah. I just wanted to just remind folks that at the town offices, there's still free at-home COVID tests available if folks need them. That's exactly oh. what I was gonna say. So, We've got testing kits for you if you need some at the town offices. Yep, free. And that's it for COVID-19, right? That we don't have any policy changes, we don't have any mandates from the governor or anything to to do so that's good um all right on to old business um uh, the first is a discussion of the bid documents for the hurley park accessibility um and we at the end of this will presumably vote to authorize or perhaps not the issuance of bid documents um so i'm going to move i'm going to move some stuff around my screen so i can see the documents that Brian sent. Okay, here we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna share the plan and then while I just sort of give a quick- Oh, okay, right okay. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So really quickly, this is a, so really we split the projects into two parts. One is the, the restroom accessibility, Part of it and the other part is the driveway and parking lot accessibility issues at Hurley. So we'll talk about the restrooms first. Um, so this is showing the work that will need to be done. It's also showing the existing setup. Um, let's see which computer do I use. So this is the, the kitchen area over here. Uh, and what we what we labeled bathroom three, bathroom two, and bathroom one. So there's three. Uh, single toilet, single sink bathrooms. Um, there's an existing wall here with a hot water tank. And then this is storage area used by the Recreation Commission. Um, so we'll, essentially, I can sum it up pretty quick. Um, what we're proposing is that we take down um, these three bathrooms essentially to the studs, to the framing, and we build them back out. Um, in order to meet um, ADA requirements, 
we need to expand one of the bathrooms. So we're suggesting bathroom one, and we'll we acquire the space by shifting this existing wall um, over. I'm not exactly sure how many feet it is. Um, and to create the clear area that we need around the sink um, and around the toilet here. Uh, so, um, so we're proposing uh, new toilets, new sinks, but essentially taking it down uh, to the studs and then so then that back up um, and install new fixtures. I suspect Fred's going to suggest that we put in air dryers instead of uh, toilet paper holder, uh, not toilet paper. Um, and <laughs> uh, paper, paper 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 towel holder based on the suggestion of the Board of Health, um, right. which would not be an issue. Um, yeah. And we're also just in terms of, and we also need to change out the door here. Um, and bump out the door a little bit to, to, to be able to expand this door and put it in the door here. Um, and the part that's not shown here, um, and it's actually part of the driveway and parking lot, but there'll be a, a, a sidewalk that's at grade from the parking lot to pay the service of the parking lot to the um, to the cement pad here. Currently, there's a probably, I don't know, a half a foot width, you know, from the ground to the the cement that would really prevent anybody in a wheelchair or other mobility issues from, from getting onto the from getting onto the slab here. So, mm. um, so that's mm. the, the restroom part of it. Um, also, in the packet, there's the uh, the scope of work, which is sort of the descriptions of of, of the work that's going to be completed. But yeah. Gosh, it's too bad that bathroom number three isn't really wide enough. It says five foot 11 inches, and then the bathroom number one is being widened to six foot zero inches. It's like one inch too small. That seems, I mean, I mean it's, that, it's that one inch. Man, I just wonder if there's an easier way to back, make bathroom number three be one inch bigger. And not have to like move the walls and stuff like that. My guess is though, somebody else has thought of that question. And uh, there's a reason why they're doing it this way. They, maybe they're not allowed to make the walls thinner by an inch or something like that. But man, darn, that's close. And um, that's kind of, it's kind of too bad. I'm curious where the, door and sink are supposed to go in bathroom number one. I'm seeing them demoed, demolished, but I'm not seeing where they're supposed to go. Probably where they. Yeah, they're actually, my understanding is that they're going to remain in the same location. Because that's ah. trying to avoid uh, moving the, the waste pipes for the toilets are in yep. the concrete okay. slab. Um, so we're trying to keep them in the same location um, and get the clear area that we need by shifting that one wall. Got it. So to, to answer Joyce's question, I, I think, yeah, I think it's pretty close, but I think the difficulty is if we moving this wall right here, there's plumbing in that wall. Yeah. Right. I think up against here is my is my guess, but it's all right. close. And we can't, and we can't like make that wall instead of well six inches or four inches, whatever it is. We can't make it like an inch skinnier, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that the width of a wall is not something that you can mess with, at least not easily. So, just I am saying, there's pipes okay. in it. The other, yeah, there's probably pipes in it. Yeah, so there have to be, you know, backing up the toilet and sink. Yeah. No, I was thinking actually the wall that's on the right. And then you'd have the to one the between sink. the bathroom three and the kitchen. Could that wall? And then you'd have to move the sink in the kitchen, which is butting up against oh. the wall. Oh, that's a sink. Okay, all right. Yeah, and and or, no, not, if you just make the wall thinner, you don't have to move anything in the kitchen. Like this wall has is like six and a half inches wide. Could we make that wall five and a half inches wide? I'm guessing somebody has thought of that and has a good reason why you can't make the wall 
five and a half inches wide. Is it cinder block now, you know? <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I that would be a good reason why you couldn't make it <laughs> thinner. Yeah, so so I, I it's just that's just too too damn bad is what I'm thinking. Anyway. Okay. Um, so we'll put in new, you know, new lab, new sinks, new toilets, um, new electrical, new electrical fixtures. We'll reuse uh, the toilet paper holders. Um, we'll add uh, mirrors that are hopefully doing a plexiglass. Um, so mm -hmm. we'll 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 renovate these and we'll uh, make one of them that they're accessible. And again, this is. The majority of this is paid for through a, a park ramp with uh, CPA matching funds. Um, so that's okay. That's the plan. Um, I can share the. Well, I could go down to be page by page, but it would be the the specs, the scope of work, essentially spell out. You know what the what the contractor needs to do. And that was in the packet. But I'm going to get into some problems. Yeah. So the scope of work was one of those documents that said not for construction. Uh, the scope of work is it says attachment A, scope of work and plans. It was right before that um, in the meeting packet. Uh, page 26 of the packet. Okay. So I just shared it. It should show up. Oh, oh okay. Okay. There you know, talked, about, talked about the demolition work that needs to be done. That's what I talked about really bringing it down to the, the framing. Mm -hmm. um, plumbing work that needs to be done. Um, we're adding a baby changing station, of course. Mm-hmm. Well, there's plenty of room in bathroom number three for that, or bathroom number one for that. Three, one, okay, see, I can't remember anymore now. Yeah. Um, I don't have ADA compliant sinks, uh, ADA compliant clear area, grab bars, uh, those things that, that folks would need to use that restroom. Um, and it talks about the electrical work that's needed, um, ceiling, light, fan combination. Um, the carpentry work, um, making sure that the flooring matches up when some of the walls are moved, um, skim coat of the flooring, the painting, um, and then the signage that's necessary outside the restrooms. You, you talked about there's a lip or something on the outside. Is that, is resolving that covered? In the specs, it's 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 um it's up to the slab, the concrete slab that the whole pavilion is on. So on the drive, when we do the driveway portion of that, okay. So the driveway, so, that, so that's the that's in the driveway portion, not in the uh, yeah the restroom portion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And who made the who made this scope of work? Because that was probably the folks from the rec commission. Um, this was in conjunction with probably some help. Um, this was me. Um, oh, it was you. Okay. And I based it off the plans of the um, the architect that we had to draw the plans, and then I asked uh, Keith and Wayne to review it. Oh, okay. What we know we needed to add him. Okay. What we weren't thinking about. Okay. Good. Good. No, I'm I'm glad. I think um, that helps because um, I. I don't know about Julie or, or Fred, but I'm probably not going to catch a detail here that's missing, right? <laughs> but uh, that you've gone over it and based it on what the architects, and they do provide detail. Um, and that Keith and um, who else you said, Wayne? Yeah, and, I, I, yeah and I, I should, I, I failed to mention, and I apologize that the original, Estimate that we have for the grant included the scope of work from JDR builders. So a, a lot of this is 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 based on their input as well. Oh, oh okay. Thank you okay. to them. 
Okay, very good. Okay, so the question on the table is, uh, can we vote to put this part of the project out for bid? We want to delay the, the asphalt to the spring because we really want the permeable asphalt and we're unlikely to get that done in the next four weeks, essentially, um, that that's probably going to have to wait till spring. So we want to just put this portion out. Is that right? Or do we also put the work for the spring out for bid and just have that lined up ahead of time? Um, if we could, if we could uh, vote on the restrooms, there's some new information I want to talk about in terms of the, the driveway okay. and parking lot, or I can talk about it now. It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Um, well, why don't we finish up the bathrooms first? Are there any other questions or comments, Julie or or Fred, about the scope no. of work and putting uh, this out to bid for the bathrooms portion? I've, I've got no problem on that scope of work. I just don't get. I don't have time to read through the scope of work. For the other, for the driveway construction, I just want to make sure that the the grading for the bathroom is in that scope of work somewhere. I just don't yeah. find it right now to look yeah. for. My understanding, yeah. it wouldn't be in the bathroom scope of work. It'd be in. Yeah, well, no, that, that's what I'm saying. The, the, the chat, I don't have time to go through the driveway scope of work now to make sure that Brian put it in there. I just want to yeah. get on record to make sure yeah. it is. Okay, Julie, how about you? It all looks good to me. Okay. Yes, well, yeah. I'd entertain a motion then. On uh, I would move that we approve the scope of work with the, the one change that we approve or we suggest air dryers, bread and paper towels for the dispense for the bathrooms. Okay, so that would be to authorize the issuance of bid documents. Is that right? Okay. okay. Well, I'll second that. Um, all right, so all those in favor? Uh, Julie? Yes. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, um, then there's a little bit to talk about the parking lot. So let me turn that over to Brian. Thank you. Uh, let me, if I can. Let's we'll see if I can get the plan up here and size that it makes sense. Um, that's existing conditions. So I don't know if people can see that or not. I'll try to orient this. <clears throat> So this is um, so this is what we're looking at down here. This is the end of the parking lot, um, the existing dirt gravel parking lot. Softball fields over here, the row of pine trees, the existing row of pine trees so is here. The south end of the parking lot. Yep. Um, that cages pavilion. This is the sidewalk that um, Fred was asking about. Um, from the pavilion to the uh, what will become the asphalt parking lot, and then the driveway goes up, um, it kind of circles up to River Road. The River Road is up here. Um, so the proposal was to, um, you know, do a little bit of grading to pave the driveway and uh, do pervious pavement. In the parking lot, so the, the the driveway down to the parking area would be regular um, hot mix asphalt, and then down in here would be uh, pervious pavement asphalt. And part of that is we're working in the wetland buffer area, um, and we have to deal with water um, that that comes off the parking lot. As most people know, there's a very steep bank um, that goes down to a brook down here. Um, so the idea is that we don't want to shed water over this bank. There's a couple areas where the bank is, is destabilizing, partially because of the condition of the parking lot and what, how the water is running off currently, uh, which was you know another motivating factor to get this done was um, there was some washout areas happening 
approximately here and here. Um, so this will hopefully, it won't fix those areas, but it should hopefully address um, those areas from getting worse. There'll be a slight uh, pitch from the parking lot actually away from the bank towards the field. And again, it's a previous pavement, so it should allow some water. It should allow water to drain through it. Um, this plan shows that the white pine trees that are there will be taken out and it will be replaced with um, a row of, I think these are uh, red oak trees and one other tree name that I'm sure Hannah remembers, but I don't. Linden. American Linden, yeah. American Linden. Um, and actually there's a, there's a separate planting plan that's uh, in the meeting packet as well. The concern with these trees is that um, they have roots that would uh, tear up the parking lot. There's concerns that um, some of these are some of the some of the tops of the these white pine trees are starting to snap off. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the the suggestion. And so the reason I wanted the reason I had said that I have the information is keep met with um, Warner Brothers paving. Um, to discuss the project. The project still needs to go out the bid, but we could get a good sense of what it is. And the costs for the pervious pavement have skyrocketed. Um, mm. the, the, but the, the quote that he received is, is essentially double of what um, we had thought it would be. Um, mm. Part of that reason is the original estimate was that it was gonna be uh, just hot mix asphalt, which is cheaper than, um, Pervious pavement. And uh, the other issue is that when pervious pavement is put down, it needs to have a, it essentially needs to be hotter outside, it needs to be warmer outside. Um, so they were saying by the middle of October, they typically don't do it because they can't guarantee that the temperature outside is gonna is gonna be warm enough for the pervious pavement to be put down. So that likely means that if we do it, as Joyce mentioned, we'll likely it would likely have to be done after the winter, um, which isn't necessarily a problem. Um, the grant funds are available um, through the end of June. So there's there's not a uh, there's not an issue with, with funding there. Um, the difficult part was, was the was the price increase of the previous pavement. Um, again, that was something that was approved by the Conservation Commission. I'm not sure if they would um, want to consider hot mix asphalt, so, so not previous pavement. We haven't had time to have a discussion yet, or whether it's something that we just think that the cost went up and, and costs go up and it's something we want to fund. I, I think that discussion's to be had, mm -hmm. um, but that's that's just information I found out today. So okay. um, I don't well, know. What, what is the ballpark dollar increase? Um, so, the grant at the budget that we had in the grant was was fifty fifty six thousand um, dollars for the pay, driveway for the parking lot, and that included some of the you know some of the loaning and seeding around around the the edges. But the quote that we have from Warner Brothers is one hundred and ten thousand um, for the for the paving and the sidewalk. So okay, that is significant. That, but that's for the whole thing. That's for the the asphalt part and the permeable part. Uh, and the sidewalk. Yeah, and the whole thing. So the whole project cost doubled. And yep. if this goes out to bid, what people bid may change, but probably not going to change that much. So we'd be looking for something in the neighborhood of fifty to sixty thousand dollars to add to be able to do the permeable. Uh, and it, it, the, it the, I'm sure it's gone up in if it were all asphalt too, but not doubling at this point. Right. Yeah. We have different avenues to explore to to you know to reduce the cost. This is this is what we have now, so that's why I don't think we should recommend that then go out to bid yet. Um, I think we should see what options we have for reducing costs. Okay. Um, some of them could be. You know, pervious versus typical hot mixed asphalt. Or it could be what, you know, what work could we do in house? Um, 
Mm -hmm. Or uh, could also depend on, on how, I mean, we'll, we'll get bids for the, you know, the restroom project. We'll have to see if those come in lower. I'm not sure that they will. Um, you know, we might have some additional money there. Um, but yeah. we just need to explore ways to, I think, to keep costs down. Okay. At this point. Yeah, but it sounds like we've got some, some breathing room if this doesn't, if it's, you know, but we want we want it to happen this spring, <laughs> absolutely. But we got a little breathing room before we have to make that decision. That's good. I like it when you give us breathing room. I like having breathing room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Julie or Fred, do you have any other uh, questions or things you want to ask about this? I uh, had a question or two. Yeah, Sorry, Fred. We. About the red oak, I know that it was a safety issue, et cetera, taking down the pine trees. Curious about red oak and the production of acorns, because um, they can be like ball bearings in a parking lot. We've that all around our house, and um, just I have I have no qualms about it. Just curiosity. What does anybody know about that? Mm. Well, our tree warden isn't here. You are so. Who's our tree warden? Uh, uh, Mr. Bardwell. Ah, huh? okay. <laughs> Keith, yeah. Keith yeah. is also our, our tree warden. A man of many hats. Absolutely. So this is the this is the planting plan that I see. And mm -hmm. I, I forget who actually did the planting plan. Hannah will probably remember. Um, Terry Reynolds had a contractor who did it. Oh, okay. They have their name on it. So there's, I see seven red oaks. Yeah, and I see TA7, American Linden, as Hannah talked about. And then there's a number of sort of shrub type bushes. Yeah. Um, we can ask that question about about the, the red oak and acorns, but yeah. yeah, I'm just curious about it. I mean, the other stuff that I see, which is bayberry and sweet fern, is like I think they're native plantings, which is really nice. And I know the oak and the linden are too. I was just curious about the safety with yeah. the oak. Well, Julie, you know what they say. What do they say? They say the acorn doesn't fall very far from the tree. So it could be all the acorns end up on the grass and none of them end up Not in the parking lot. lot. That could happen. I'm so tickled that I was able to think of that <laughs> at the right time. Do we want to bring conservation committee back into this? You know, they approved this, I know, with the pervious, but... To... Yeah, they may need to be looped back in. If, yeah, if, if we go down the route of, if that's the route we prefer to, to go, or, or if that's the route that we want to pursue, we would have to go back for an amended order of conditions. Um, we're holding off on recording. We have the, we have an existing order of conditions now, which includes that and it needs to be recorded with the registry, but we're holding off for a little while to record that in case we do need to do that. <laughs> yeah, because if there are significant changes to this, they will have to come back on board. And they may have suggestions about how to trim around the edges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it sounds like we're done with this particular item. Um, the other item under old business was the request for proposals for the long-term lease of the center school. And I think there's been a delay on getting feedback from council. So um, I think this item, uh, we should table it for next meeting because I think we would need the advice of council for that. Yeah, I was hoping to get um, a sample long-term lease from, from council with you know specific language that we could review. That we would include with the request for proposals and i haven't gotten that back yet okay. um, between um last meeting and this meeting um julie myself and keith walked through the center school just to sort of 
refresh ourselves as to the, the condition of the building and it's yeah it need, it need, it's it's still the way you described it yeah um yeah and even he pointed out some some areas of the roof where this where the slate slate seems to have slid either down or off so mm. it, it's an issue it's i think something needs to be done yeah sooner um it's not getting any better it's not it's not repairing itself oh oh i was disappointed yeah. to see that yeah, yeah well you know second law thermodynamics and all um okay great well then let's go to the new business and we'll look for something on that later on another meeting um so we have a discussion about community compact municipal best practices grant program my understanding is hannah has done all the hard work of looking at all the different things we could apply for and it's going to have some um some recommendations for what we should apply for with so. some help from brian yeah okay all right um so for folks who might not be familiar with it, the Community Compact is a grant program that municipalities enter into um, with the state to enact best practices that the state has set out in a number of different areas, including agent dementia, DEI, education, energy, finances, housing. There's a big list online. Um, so Brian and I had the opportunity to kind of chat about some potential best practices that might apply best to the town of Waitley. Um, we listed them in this, um, in an email that I sent out. Um, so I can go through the list. I think um, what I'm looking for from the select board are your top two priorities. We're allowed to apply for two best practices through the program. The grant funding isn't significant. Um, they don't list a figure online, but our understanding is that it's around max 20,000 per best practice. Okay. So you said you sent us an email with the, this list? Yes. Or, okay. I'm not showing, um, it's not coming up in my list when I put I don't it. In. Yeah, I don't have one that's directly from you. Was it like couched in, uh, like attached to an email that Brian sent? I do remember seeing one where it said, you could click on this link and go look at this huge list. Um, um, I sent it on uh, Thursday the 8th at 314. It's titled Community Compact Best Practices. I can also resend it out now. That would be easier to have it at the top of your list. Yeah, that would, yeah, yeah, I think resending it now is probably a good okay. It's a good idea because I'm still not finding it under. You bet. That you're almost done now. Okay. The, the best practice areas that you had up just a minute ago. That's the website. Those are the categories. Right. That, that's, those are categories of the best practice. Oh. Yeah. Don't worry, there's more. Oh, good. Oh, okay. Yeah. That brought it to the top. Somehow that made it easier for me to find it. Yes, and this oh. is the email I was thinking of. Here's the link to the list, which I did not follow that link to see the list, but you've got the list up on the other screen. Yeah, it's a long list. Um, so, yeah. which so is great there. Yeah. Is this the complete list that you've got showing on the shared screen? The well, just, like each of those is a pull down menu to a uh, like another five yeah. or six hundred things exactly yeah okay all right all right have you done some narrowing down already yeah so um in that email we have a narrowed down list of five bullet points that we think might be the best fit for waitley okay um including electric vehicle infrastructure, um, master plan update, residential and commercial composting, which is especially relevant given our earlier presentation, mm -hmm. um, supporting agriculture and human resources, employee policies and procedures update. Um, mm -hmm. But again, these are suggestions. I will defer to the select board for your top preferences. In, in the category list just now, I saw one of the areas was regionalization. Can we 
look at yeah because i think that that's something that we're always going to have to be looking at regionalization yeah Oh, that's a really short. That one doesn't have six hundred options. Hmm. <laughs> Great. I like the idea of that one as being one of our areas to look at. Right, because well, the, like at this point, we've regionalized our uh, middle school, high school. We've regionalized our senior center. We've regionalized our EMS. Um, we've regionalized all the stuff that's well, relatively easy to regionalize. Things like fire and police are gonna be substantially harder. Um, I'm trying to think of how would a grant help us to overcome the barriers that would be from regionalizing those services and then not Sure. Well, it it may also that. be how to handle already regionalized services, like how best to deal with senior center issues. Mm, yeah. You know, when, once you've regionalized, you have to deal with your neighbors. Mm. Just yeah. as a thought, I did just jumped out at me as right. <laughs> well, we have yeah. to do a lot of yeah well to play devil's advocate often when i've gone to meetings uh and they talk about regionalization they point at us and say these guys really are great regionalization people they they regionalize things and they do it well so we'd be kind of saying <laughs> it, it might be they'll point us to to um to skims as a model for regionalization, which may not be so helpful, but that's that's just me being pessimistic. I, didn't, didn't, I saw that. And... Yeah, huh. I hadn't thought about that, Fred. So it's just... Uh, um, it's just that that covers, or at least brings in many of the other areas as well. Yeah. And uh, well, I guess the other thing for regionalization, if your regionalization partners are also putting in community compact grants on regionalization, then that might actually be good. I don't know what the other towns are planning. Presumably they're in the same position we are. They're just seeing this list now and they're trying to decide. There is, so this is a rolling deadline too. So um, if, if we want more time to sort of mold all of these 1800 choices over, that's a possibility as well. I, when this started, I think there was like 16 choices. <clears throat> it's just grown as Ooh, the years have gone on. Exponential. But there was a significant number of choices. Yeah. Our last master plan, I feel like that might be close to 20 or 30 years old. Is that, am I wrong on that? It certainly expired. Um, mm. I don't remember exactly. That's diplomatic. That's what we love about Brian, though. He's very diplomatic. <laughs> so greater than 10 years. I think our last update to the plan was in 2011. The last official master plan in its entirety was in the 90s. See, that's okay. what I was afraid of, that it was in the 90s. But there was an update. Okay, that... Uh, that kind of gets us at least into a respectable position. Okay. I love the idea of a farmer's market and supporting agriculture. Um, since walking through the center school with Brian, I've been tossing around in my head what could happen with that building. And I know that we're gonna put it out at some point put out an RFP and have other people come up with ideas. But I did wonder about um, what they do in Europe. And I guess what they've got in Boston in Quincy Market is a covered market that's not necessarily 
it doesn't need quite as much um structure and, and well structure it needs to hold up but it doesn't need quite as much uh internal electrical plumbing etc as an actual building that people would be working in 24 7 or needing to stay warm in um thinking of some kind of a covered mm. market that, like you could roll things up and roll things down and people could have booths and areas and we could make use of that building possibly in a slightly cheaper way than redoing it. Mm, that's an interesting idea. And get funding for it. Ooh. Well, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> I like this idea. I worry about parking there for such a thing. Mm, yeah, yeah it's a small parking lot. Could we um could we ask the Ag Commission to weigh in on that? If they if you know we have two kind of fairly well established uh, farm stands, seasonal farm stands in town where I know that um at least one the one that I know a little bit better, um you know, sells fruit from various farms. So farms are already cooperating on getting mm -hmm. their food out locally at farm stands. Um, I'm wondering if their input on that, because it says establishing farmers market or other marketing for farms. I wonder if they already have some ideas. Um, and that might be, it might be good to um, just see if we can ask them uh, what, you know, what do they think? of that. Um, oh, that and, and, and I guess for the com residential commercial composting, we just had the people here. I'm sure they would comment on what would they do with um, uh, a potentially a $20,000 grant. I think we'd get a lot of mm -hmm. big water containers <laughs> and a big stockpile of compostable cups, I suppose. I don't know if that's really the appropriate use. Um, I do know our master plan, though, is in, well, is expired. Um, and I don't know how money helps you get a master plan other than if you can hire somebody for 20K to do all the work involved, which mostly means getting people together for meetings and discussing things. And maybe the, maybe there, there's more to it, like getting, in, getting input from all kinds of people. Um, who have very little time, right? So I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that. Um, the EV infrastructure, that would actually be money for stations, right? So it might cover one or two stations and we know we're gonna eventually need one at the, uh, when you say the safety complex, that's the like the highway department and police department area over there, right? Right. Yeah. And then also I happen to know <laughs> from being on the on the personnel committee that our employee policies and procedures and even job descriptions that needs we need professional help. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I think the, the five you identified um, and maybe uh, regionalization, if we can think of what what that money could be used for those might i feel like i want a little more information i don't want to impose something on the local farms that they don't want or need mm -hmm. um, um yeah but it sounds like that might be also part of what hannah was going to do anyway right <laughs> yeah. yeah so you want us to narrow this down to how many two two um, and like Brian said, this is a rolling deadline. So if you'd like to take more time with it, that's totally fine. I can take the time to reach out to the Ag Commission. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I say we take a little more time with it. It's a big list to go through. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long yeah. list. And so I, many valuable yeah. things to do. Yeah. I feel like we've had other opportunities to apply for grants for EV infrastructure. We just haven't gotten any of them yet. Is that, am I wrong about that? Yeah, so um, even with those EV grants, um, 
if we go through the contractors who we've been talking to and getting quotes from, um, there will still be, they don't cover specific parts of the installation of the charging station. So that will cost about $20,000 per station. Oh, okay. So it'd be like this in combination with some other grant to get a charging station put in. Exactly. I see. So that, oh, okay. I'd forgotten about that. You mentioned that at a previous meeting. Boy, I feel like we're trying to decide between some really tangible things like a charging station and a, mm -hmm. a less tangible thing, um, probably for most people, a master plan. Um, so, Joyce, I still like your input on personnel because there have been questions about personnel policies that have come mm -hmm. up. Yeah. But they won't let us apply for five. Yeah. Well, could we get a little more information? It might be that the Board of Health and Franklin County Solid Waste would not make a strong applicant. Or, or you know, they like, what are we gonna do with twenty thousand dollars? I'm not sure that that would be a strong one or not. Maybe asking them, um, and then agriculture. I know the master plan is needed and the help with um, with personnel policies is greatly needed as are charging stations. Um, but I also don't want to, I mean, we gotta basically cross off three of these. We have to cross off four who wanna put regionalization on there. Um, I, I think master plan and personnel to my mind would take precedence over regionalization at this point anyway. Okay. So I'll, I'll withdraw that suggestion. Okay. Okay. All right. I, 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 I like the idea of doing for things like master plan and personnel. Rep, now, as much as I like charging stations, that's an area where there could be other grants that come into play. There aren't too many grants that are going to help us with personnel or master plan, for instance. Yeah. And my understanding for from the personnel committee is that we we just basically need a knowledgeable person to look at the policies we have and make suggestions about how to improve them. That's a very doable thing. Um, and arguing that, you know, that it's, it's very clear what you would spend the money on. Um, for a master plan, um, I might not be able to make a coherent sentence about it, but somebody in this room could make the coherent argument of what that money would be spent on. It'd be on basically professional help to take our master plan and bring it into the 21st century again, right? And, and that, so it's like paying, paying a professional to help us. So, so to me, those are very tangible. Um, I don't know for the composting, for the agriculture, I think that's where I don't have as good an idea of what we would be asking for and why some input from those committees would be really helpful. To totally throw a monkey wrench in it, is any of this, um, would any of this be able to be used to fill some of the gap in the funding for the pervious pavement um, and in, an environmental, let's see, we've got water resource management, best practices, reduce infiltration and inflow to minimize unintended storm and wastewater, um, mm. possible variety of different ways we could go and say, we, we actually have a project that we would put this money directly into right now. If I understand the program correctly, it it isn't a program for for that kind of micro program. It's more for the bigger picture things. And am I judging it correctly? So the way that they describe it, let me pull it up verbatim. Um, uh, 
A community compact is a voluntary mutual agreement entered into between the Baker Polito administration and individual cities and towns of the Commonwealth. In a community compact, a community will agree to implement at least one best practice that they select from across a variety of areas. The community's chosen best practices will be reviewed between the Commonwealth and the municipality to ensure that the best practices are chosen are unique to the municipality and reflect needed areas of improvement. So I think it's kind of vague, perhaps purposefully. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Especially if we're trying to fit specific projects into a best practice category, I don't think we can enact an entire best practice with only $20,000. Um, or maybe you can with some of them, but like, for example, we can't get electric vehicle charging stations all over town for only $20,000. So mm -hmm. in that sense, we might be able to use that funding for a specific project and apply it to a best practice. For instance, under sustainable development and land protection, best practice invest in land conservation or park creation and restoration via Community Preservation Act, or other funds to protect land and provide outdoor recreation. Uh, best uh, water resource management, best practice, uh, well, uh, not that one. Yeah, manage water and wastewater assets for timely maintenance and rehabilitation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I could see that a case could be made for um, the pervious pavement being a best practice in terms of wastewater management and an environmentally sound practice. Just mm -hmm. looking for money where we don't have it. Right. Well, part of Hannah's job is figuring out, like, what are the grant funders <laughs> really looking for? Are they really looking for, um, like, a, a <laughs> sorry for the pun, a concrete application of a best practice? Or are they looking for, you know, bringing your practices up to best practices? Um, and, and I'm not sure which one it is. Maybe Hannah has some insight, but it might be something you've got to look in to a little bit more is that what am i I'll I'd, like, up and speak. <laughs> I'd like to read the application more before um knowing exactly what they're looking for it's a very very short brief application it doesn't require a big project narrative like other applications we've done have um, okay so i imagine that we'll be able to kind of shape it to what we're hoping for but let me look back at the application before i give okay. you any promises all right this the, the the grant staff for this program, I mean, we can have a very open and frank conversation about, hey, we're thinking about this, and they'll say, okay, or they'll say, no, I don't think so. So it's not like, oh, okay. the, application, not like the application programs where it's like, you can ask a question up till September 7th, and then after that, you know, we're going dark until the awards are made. It's, it, there's, mm -hmm. there's the opportunity for back and forth, and we've had a couple of these um, grant awards before uh, for IT and for, for water. And mm. at least for the water one, I mean, our, our our purpose for what we spent the funds on really morphed as the water merger project went along. So they were they were really really flexible. So I imagine that's still this case. So. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Well, do we have any more guidance for Hannah on this? Do your magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do, do my best. Magic. Hear from me in a couple of weeks on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe at our next meeting, we'll we'll have a little more, um, a little more information. We can be a little bit better about giving you more specific guidance. That sounds great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, we have two more items under new business. One is uh, discuss the recent legislative amendments to the state cannabis control laws which was very depressing reading from our packet. <laughs> but, uh, uh, let me turn that over to Brian. Yeah, so do you want the bad news first or the bad news first? Well, I'll we'll take the bad news. <laughs> uh, I'll share my screen from... Okay. The, the summary from town council.
maybe. There it is. So at the end of the legislative session, there were amendments to the cannabis control law. Um, I will characterize them, characterize them as heavily in favor of the cannabis industry. And I think that's an accurate um, description. I would almost go as far as to say that they're hostile to municipalities. Um, so that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and it, they're unfortunate. Um, so it, it really impacted host community agreements, um, which of course, Waitley has a number of them with, um, I gotta use a different computer, um, with a number of different uh, cannabis established, marijuana establishments. But um, a focus of the, of the legislation was um, uh, uh, sort of targeted towards uh, community impact fees. Um, it was, it's been a big complaint of the industry about community impact fees and, um, that municipalities were unfair and municipalities were blackmailing them. And it was just, it, it's anyway, so they bought the, they being the state legislature bought that argument and they really tightened down, um, as to what municipalities can do, um, so before, really, what we had prior to this legislation was municipalities can 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 charge a three, up to a three percent community impact fee, and those expenditures need to be related to um, reasonably related to impacts created by the the, the marijuana establishment. Um, really, so the new legislation has essentially said that um, post community agreements can can charge up to the 3% um, of the gross sales. Um, it's only limited to eight years now. Um, and that any any impact fee that's charged needs to be based on actual documented costs of the prior year. Um, costs need to be uh, carefully documented. And... Um, Uh, the cost must be carefully documented, and then it provides a legislative remedy for a breach of contract claim that allows uh, marijuana or marijuana establishments that feel like they have been aggrieved by a municipality to not only sue them for breach of contract, um, but it also includes, um, they can also sue a municipality for damages, um, including um, attorney's fees. So um, sort of the risk benefit analysis to municipalities, I think has changed um, in terms of the, the uh, community impact fee. Um, uh, so, I mean, in terms of, I don't want to talk specifics about uh, our host community agreements at this time, because um, I want to see if, if, I think it's discussions that we need to have. I'm not sure if those are discussions that we have um, at this point. Right now. Um, yeah. Whether that's something that um, could be subject to an executive session. Um, the legislation is also not clear how it affects existing host community agreements. Um, it, it doesn't talk about the legislation. It, it, it just doesn't talk about how those are impacted. Um, and it also gives the uh, Cannabis Control Commission regulatory authority over host community agreements. So in the past, they, it was unclear whether they had it. Well, it's clear now that, that they can review um, and presumably reject um, host community agreements that, that are agreed to by a municipality and an applicant. Um, so that's, I guess at this point, because they're the, the regulatory agency, um, they are supposed to provide us guidance as to what you know what an appropriate post-community agreement would look like. One of 
one of my biggest complaints, and I had to express this to our uh, legislature legislators um, while this was being considered, is that we don't really know what impacts, you know, what is a what is a community impact under the statute. Um, I had hoped that they would include some definition, you know, some definitions as to, you know, what those impacts might be, which would give municipalities some certainty as to what costs they could address with the community impact fee, but we just don't know. And at this point, I think we're left to the courts to sort of wade through what that is in some lucky municipality that gets to be the first test case. Um, mm. Probably not Waitley. Um, mm. So um, really, it's it's disappointing for me to see this um, at this point. You know, I, we have I think eleven host community agreements. Many of them have been have expired, um, but we do have one establishment that is currently active. They have not paid a community impact fee yet. Um, it would be due probably next spring. Um, so mm -hmm. questions that I, I think we need to grapple with over the next couple months is sort of what do we think uh, those impacts are and can we quantify them? And uh, I, I think that's something that, that municipalities need to think about um, while waiting for the, you know, the guidance from the, the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, we haven't, I haven't received any requests from, from any establishments to amend existing HCAs. Um, I don't know if those are, are forthcoming or not. Um, so it's, it, it's a big change. I, I think it, 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 it sort of makes the community impact be sort of not attractive at this point, um, especially with all the administrative work and sort of the uncertainty that exists if, if we spend it on X, are we going to, you know, are someone going to take us to court and then we'll have to pay, you know, their attorney's fees if we lose it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's disappointing for, yeah. for me to see that. Least. And, and even paying our attorney's fees, which could be more than what we'd get from the fee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So do you happen to know um, if our legislators voted in favor of this i didn't look it up i know it's usually in the newspaper which way they voted i i don't know for certain um i will i, I I'll, I'll just talk about the this next part here because okay i know certainly that i think they were in favor of the next part and that was um mm -hmm. you know the effort to address um i keep using the wrong computer here um the other part of the legislation was an attempt to sort of address those disproportionately harmed or those socially disadvantaged businesses. Um, because, and I think that we've, that we've seen here, I think it's an example of the industry as a whole, the, the, the folks who have, who have got through the host community agreement process, the permitting process, um, and have got opened or close to open are very well funded. Um, mm. And those who were probably, you know, I'll generalize for a second, those who are, who were less funded and less experienced did not make it through. Um, and I think that's I think that's unfortunate. Um, so the other part of that legislation was to try to, I guess, try to level the playing field a bit. Um, unfortunately, I it's Fred and I were talking earlier, I think they did it the wrong way. Um, because the other requirement is that host communities have to adopt procedures and policies yeah. that you know establish minimum standards for facilitating opportunities. Um, I don't know what that means. Like what, what that we we like everybody who comes in the door gets an HCA. You know, you get an HCA and you get an HC. We are not discriminating <laughs> against anybody in our host community agreements. Um, so I, I don't know what this means, uh, minimum standards for facilitating opportunity. 
I don't know what that means. Yeah, I think you heard Fred, my and Fred's conversation yeah. before the before the meeting. <laughs> is that's exactly what I told him. I said we have I, we may have had 12, 13 people come in front of us, and we have eleven HCAs. And like you said, the board, as long as you met these minimum standards to you know these community standards, it didn't matter who you were or how much money you had. Were you um, breathing? Could you sign a piece of paper? I, 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 think really? their I think their problem was the people who never even got that far because they didn't have enough money even to get in their foot in the door. Right. And that's who they're trying to address somehow. Right. This is somehow, but, but it's not us keeping them out of oh, the yeah. door. Yeah. It's, I, the, I it's the Cannabis Control Commission that's keeping them out of the door with all the other rules that they have to. As, yeah, so yeah, I sort yeah. of feel like they're putting it on us, really? Us? You know, the people who are, we practically give these things out, like anybody walks in the door, we'll give them a host community agreement. You know, but it's, so I have no idea what that means. If we have to adopt a policy, then I, I'd i be interested in seeing if, if anybody else adopts a policy, taking a look at theirs and seeing, if that, uh, seeing what that really means. Because it must mean something. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that uh, this is very vaguely worded, but those disproportionately harmed by marijuana prohibition, I would take to mean all the folks who are in jail and uh, the community who is not white, who were disproportionately harmed over the years by um, getting arrested for marijuana possession prior to it becoming legal and um, white people coming in and making it a business. That's my guess what this means. But, but what does a minimum standard for facilitating opportunity for those people look like? That's the part I don't understand. Yeah, what I is no this idea. minimum standard? I don't know what that means. And I, mean, I agree that it's weird to put it on individual, on communities rather than have something at yeah. a state level. It, it, it strikes me there's a legislative backstory here that we do not know about, about how, how this got brought to the, to the right. floor and yeah. considered in the first, but there's someone or one somewhere. I see you, Judy. For whom this would be a benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got to remember the planning board here. You might want to. Uh, well, we have looked. Time. We have looked at a lot of. Um, obviously, a lot of marijuana applications. I would point out that the original legislation said that the community impact fee should be related to the expenses incurred, and somehow this this spiraled and i think yeah. in that sense the legislature has gone back to the original intent and i think at the time this was passed it was thought that those expenses would be fairly high this maybe turned out that that's not the case but i just wanted to make that point and also once you're through with this i would be interested in knowing whether Brian has any updates on this legislation, marijuana legislation for social clubs, which I think is the next thing that's looming for Waitley, marijuana social clubs. And I haven't warned them about, warned him about this, so that I give him a little time to think about it. <laughs> I, I haven't, I haven't heard of any updates. I know that they were going to have the pilot community. Um, okay. My understanding, their pilot community say would go on for a while, but Whitley needs to think about mm. allowing. Yeah, we we do have we have someone who's who wants to do that sort of business as soon as it's legal. So well, we we need to yeah, just to, to have you think about it. We I know the planning board has no idea about what the appropriate requirements are to do this. Yeah. And, and so I hope there will be guidance from somebody somewhere, but anyway. 
I, excuse I my it's... excuse my minimally informed interruption. <laughs> I would say if this revision, this new act, is any indication, there will be major changes after the results of the pilot program come back. Well, yes, and and I hope we learn from the pilot program so that we know things like. I, we don't know about ventilation. We don't know about parking. We don't know about employees exposure. We, there's, there's, there's phenomenal numbers of issues involved that we, we have no knowledge of. We tend to be ahead of the curve in Franklin County. Peggy Sloan at FERCOG and I spent a lot of time commiserating and it's good in one sense, it's bad in another sense, because you, you're you always, um, we usually tend to be ahead of things before they develop, but, but um, it's painful getting there. You know, the, the pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their backs. So, so mm -hmm. bear with us as we get there, but just, just keep your eyes posted because this is gonna be the next thing on the horizon. Thank you. Okay, I think we uh, we sort of caught Brian mid rant. There's like a whole other section here that's been highlighted. The, the other bad news. I can, I, yeah, I, I can I can wrap it up too. But when I said I think that it's hostile towards municipalities, this is I think with the addition of the breach of contract claim, the damages, the attorneys' fees, and then this sort of threat if we don't adopt these policies that they're going we're going to forfeit. You know you know, a monetary amount equal to the annual total amount of community impact fees. It's, uh, I, I don't know. It just seems hostile towards municipalities and it just felt like municipalities have been the scapegoat for lots of problems within the industry that aren't necessarily caused by the municipalities. But I'll stop ranting. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, the Cannabis Control Commission We'll, we'll wait on um, rules and regulations. You know, it talks about the act directs the CCC to promulgate rules and regulations applicable to negotiation and approval of HCAs. So with, to work with social equity businesses and economic prominent priority applicants, as well as to prepare a model HCA. I don't know what any of that means, um, but yeah. we can wait and see until that point. Um, and it could be that they write all the host community agreements and we don't have to, <laughs> but I don't right. think I like that. I don't think I like that one a little bit. Or there's, it, and really the community impact fee was the only sort of whole of revenue for, um, from any sort of cultivation establishment or manufacturing and processing establishments, right? There's only, the only monetary benefit for municipalities is if they have a retail. If they have a retail location because there's a three percent excise tax. So, um, yeah. really, the sort of the if if a municipality reason for allowing them was was financially based, it, this sort of really pulls the rug out from under that. Um, yeah. Um, I guess we can wait till the the CCC complicates rules and regulations, unless we have to address you know an HCA request sooner. We would have to sort of consider our options whether we say you know what well, we're going to wait till the ccc um you know comes up with this rules and regulations or whether we want to sort of dip our toe in the water and um yeah yeah whatever we want to do um okay but, or just try to negotiate something all right okay well being mindful of the time it seems like we're we're at the point of having vented on this legislative amendment, but uh, there's not a voting action item we have tonight, just kind of a heads up that this is going to be coming up uh, in our future at some point. Okay. Um, we've got the last item under new business. We've got two unsigned letters expressing concern over the property located at 148 State Road. Um, and uh, the lot number is given here uh, on State Road, which is just north of the 148 State Road, if I uh, remember correctly from the letters. 
Um, yeah. And uh, there's multiple things that disturb me about this one. Um, that the letters were unsigned is understandable in the sense that the people also expressed like fear of retaliation from the from the folks at 148 State Road. And um, I think that's just, I, I mean, I, I don't want to live in a community where people feel afraid of their neighbors. Um, and I guess by the end of the discussion, which I hope will only carry us shortly past eight o'clock, um, I, I hope we have some uh, options or we're working towards finding some options for what we can do to um, kind of address that situation. Um, I don't, you've, uh, you've all read them. Maybe I should let Brian uh, say something first, but uh, Fred or, or Julie, um, I don't know if you have some things to add. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll just read the sort of restate what, what Joyce said. Um, the town received, you know, an anonymous letter. This is the one that I'm sharing right now, dated August 16th, expressing concern about uh, the current uh, business at 148 State Road, um, and expressed concerns about. Um, whether it was meeting standards related to the home occupation bylaw. Um, and as Joyce said, there was there was discussions about, um, you know, the reason it being unsigned was there was uh, it talks about here. Uh, I spoke with several of the residents who lived next to there and none of them were happy with it, but are afraid to say anything against them for fear of retaliation. Um, so that was stated in the letter from, from August 16th. The, the town received a second letter dated August 24th. Um, and it talked about uh, the property immediately to the north of um, that business, um, which is owned by a family member who um, is proposing in addition to an existing barn on the property. Um, and it was concerned that that the property at or the, the the business at 148 State Road would would sort of leak over and onto that property. I think is is what the concern was. Um, the property that we're talking about to um, to the north of that was was proposed for commercial rezoning at the most recent annual town meeting. It, it, it did not pass. Um, so that's. So sort of those are the facts of the town has received those two letters and that's essentially the contents of those two letters. So um, that's that's pretty much what happens. At, at any point has there ever been as a building inspector going to check over whether the existing property is conforming with the code. Um, I I don't know specifically if he's if he's been there. Um, I, certainly I think he's aware of he, he's certainly aware of the situation. I don't know if he has been to the property or not. Um, no. I don't know of any well, oftentimes, if, if there's requests for enforcement, I'll see the enforcement letter that 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 sent out. Um, but in this case, I haven't I haven't seen it. So I don't yeah, we have to assume there has not been any right enforcement action. Right. And so, who has standing to be requesting enforcement? I mean, the neighbors do, but they don't want to put their name on a piece of paper out of yeah. fear. Um, is there anyone else who has standing to request enforcement? Um, yeah, I would uh, certainly certainly a resident could petition. I, I'm not sure that sure that the zoning act specifies. It, mm. Maybe it does. Maybe maybe Judy knows better than I. But I'm, I don't think it specifies sort of who can request an enforcement action. Um, so I think it could be an individual or. 
um, county building inspector or in force driving down the street and seeing what he what appears to be a violation. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, would the select board be able to request enforcement or is that not done for some reason that um i i don't see why they couldn't i'd have again i'd have to look at the the, the okay. text of the only act but i would think that a, a town border committee would have standing to to make that request mm -hmm. joyce mm -hmm. uh yeah judy I'd just like to add that the planning board did review the building permit application at the request of the building inspector and did require that, that the applicant testify that it not be commercial property or done in support of the adjacent property. So, the building inspector was sensitive to the issue to that extent. That doesn't address the problem on the basic property, but mm -hmm. he he's clearly sensitive enough to the issue to know that there's an issue here. Yeah, yeah not knowing the zoning <laughs> as well as probably other people in the room here, he does the first letter does seem to have um, evidence of, I mean, they he, I mean, they claim he, they have 10 employees or more sometimes. Um, that's probably something that could be verified. I don't know exactly how to get at that information. Um, uh, that there's um, uh, no external change made to the residential appearance, they say, the commercial barn does not adhere to the residential appearance, nor does the parking lot. Um, uh, the signage, I'm less familiar with signage laws, but trucks having big signs on them, I, I, I understand that. Um, they've got data from one day. I don't know how that's been um, documented, but uh, presumably that would be reproducible data. Um, the commercial truck parking is clearly visible from the neighbors and that there's definitely more than four parking places. I mean, these all seem really straightforward violations. So, or, you know, it, even if, it, you know, if one of the, if one of them, like, oh, how many truck, trucks coming in and out per day on any given day? Um, Joyce, um yeah. The planning board and the building inspector both feel that they can't act on an anonymous complaint. Yeah, that, I understand and, that, that, and, that, that they can't. So, so, so we're in a quandary about you can't tackle it. And Brian probably can express this better than I can. But you yeah. can't tackle this head on. You can't. I, I think it's it's somehow a matter of stepping back and if you're gonna act on that letter, it needs to be indirect. Either that or you get the billing inspector to act on what he sees driving by, but Brian, help me out here. Yeah, some of these may be easier to act on than others. Well, the, right? the problem so, like, is- if, there, if there's either four parking places or there's more than four parking places. Okay. Something to build well, we've been people. there since the very beginning. The, the planning board objected to this on day one. And the problem is that that the building inspector approves the occupancy permit when it's a construction site and the landscaping isn't approved. Um, so, so I think I think the issue is how to how to step back and tackle the problem indirectly because because seriously we we can't act on an anonymous letter it it's not appropriate we have no legal status to do that yeah but, Brian, so my, that, my question who has standing to write a letter well, 
and ask Ryan, them to look how into would it. you step back or or well i think uh, this is I'm, I'm sharing if you can see that i'm sharing the this is 40 mm -hmm. section seven of the it just talks about a request in writing to enforce such ordinance or bylaws. Um, and it just, it doesn't specify, it just talks about a party essentially, right? It talks about, we shall notify in writing the party requesting such enforcement or any action where it was attacked. Um, so I don't think it specifies um, exactly mm -hmm. who had standing, um, which would make me think that really anybody within the town could probably make that request, possibly outside the town. Um, and I, I guess the question in my mind is sort of what's what's the best approach to resolving the the issue here. And I and, and I don't know if if it would be worthwhile to um, just have a have a meeting with um, the property owners and, and let them know that you know there's that, that there's concerns within the neighborhood and just sort of talk about how they could be addressed um that seems to me a, a little bit less uh i don't want to say confrontational but it seems to be a little less um i guess maybe judy's using the word indirect mm -hmm. um because because I, I I think I think the remedy here, and again, this isn't legal and funny, sir. It's just my opinion. I think the remedy here is that is that if the if the business is going to operate outside of the home occupation bylaw that it's currently operating under, it would require the receipt of a special permit um, and site plan site plan uh, review by the planning board and special permit from the CBA. Um, that's my reading of, of the bylaws. Um, and I don't know if, if, if the building inspector agrees with me or not, um, because essentially he interprets the bylaw, right? He's a zoning enforcement officer and his, one of his main jobs is to interpret the bylaw. Um, so as I'm talking, maybe the first step is, uh, is an email or a letter from the select board to the building inspector asking for his interpretation of the situation. Um, and maybe we, maybe, maybe we go from there. Um, no. I kind of like the idea of having a, well, I guess proceeding slowly, given the kind of the feelings involved, you know, that people have expressed um, fear of retaliation. So um, I, like when does the property owner or business owner uh, get into the, you know, kind of get into the loop, right? And uh, become a part of the discussions. Um, I don't know if that should happen first or building inspector should happen first, but um, they, well, if they're paying attention here, they know that there's, uh, they'll know at least that there's a problem that we're hearing about and they may or may not be aware of it. Um, they probably are aware of at least of some of what their neighbors think, um, I'm guessing. But uh, yeah, when when do those people get looped in to help solve the situation? Is uh, Joyce, I, I would think that, we, that the building inspector would have to get looped in first. Only yeah. because if the, if the building inspector does not agree that there's a violation, then it stops right there. Yeah. Okay. It, it never gets as far as the, the property owner. Yeah. Okay. That's that's actually reasonable and logical. Okay. And, I mean, the, the, the building inspector is an integral part of whatever the solution here is. Because it, there, ultimately, there would have to be some level of threat of enforcement. Hmm. Okay. You, you can't meet with any property owner and say, will you please do this? We're not going to do anything about it if you don't. Yeah. 
Well, then um, writing that letter to the building inspector, who's going to write the draft? Brian, of course. Thank you. <laughs> um, and that, uh, so that's something that may even end up on our on our next meeting agenda. Okay. Also, it you've probably already said this, but it does seem like there are two separate issues. One is what's going on on the property as it is currently, and one is applying for a permit to build something else. And it, yeah. am I understanding that correctly, Judy? Yeah, the, the, um, the property with the commercial structure is owned by Kyle Monahan, who is the son yeah. of the owners of the property to the north. Mm -hmm. And it's the owners of the property to the north who applied for the building permit. Okay. And um, the planning board has asked for the building inspector to certify before he issues. The building inspector nicely, actually, being somewhat sensitized to the situation, um, nicely um, asked the planning board for advice and they, uh, they sent back a document that I can see is forwarded to you people um, okay. asking that he certify that it's not commercial, gonna be commercial or in support of the neighboring property. Uh, I haven't heard what the building inspector has done mm -hmm. and I will get that back to you as well. Part of the concern, if I, again, if I understand it correctly, seems to be that previously, the property that has a commercial trucking enterprise was not supposed to be commercial and then it kind of slipped under and it I'm trying that's to put it. words together here that that's politely phrased that, that the, that the <laughs> um, and and it's it's the difficulty it, we all have the property was allowed on the basis of being a home occupation uh-huh and the home occupation was based on the fact that the building itself that the garage is in was less than 50% occupied by the commercial enterprise, which is a part of the bylaw. Yeah. Um, you've, you've read the complaint by the abutter about all the landscaping problems since. And the the occupancy permit was issued before all of those trucks and trailers and things moved in. And we've been kind of at, we've, we've been definitely at an impasse ever since. Because both the planning board and the building inspector would be willing to hold off on issuing any other permit for additional the problem is the additional uh, permit is not to the owner of the commercial property at, at issue. But to a family member. Yeah. But to a family member, I see. Well, but they're they're totally legal separate entities. Right. Right. No, no. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't okay, I didn't understand. We have, we have turned this back to the building inspector. He's the zoning enforcement officer. I wouldn't presume to tell him how to do his job. Um, I've had concerns about it, how he does his job from time to time, but he handles towns all over Franklin County. And um, yep. but but they're not two similar entities, so right. so you My can't you was, can't link like it's a good thought. I wish we could yeah. go there. We what can. did you do with that before we go find out what you're going to do with this? But you is not the same you. It's not the right. same you. I did not realize that. Thank mm -hmm. you for clarifying. Okay. All right. So the um, our action item is Brian's going to write up a draft for us to um, consider sending in. We've got that maybe on our next two weeks from now meeting agenda. Okay, well, that's everything that's on our agenda uh, the, for us. We've got uh, town administrator updates. Yep, I'll keep these quick. It's 
and a lot of two hours. Yeah, it's, for us, um, this is a late meeting. Oh. Some um, other towns, they're just getting started after two hours, but us. <laughs> not um, us. For merger project update, um, at the end of last week, I know that the utility poles that they needed to be installed were installed, I believe, um, in that I believe that they have electricity or almost have electricity. Not yet. As, as a, still not yet? When, still not yet. Wayne, okay. Wayne for it. Um, I know the poles were installed because we saw those. Yeah, I, I stopped by today. Okay. Wayne is still waiting. Gotcha. So I know the poles are up there. I think that I think, I think they were installed in the transformer that he needed, but I guess he's still not hooked up. Um, so um, it will happen soon. We don't know exactly when, but um, it should happen soon. Um, soon, probably meaning about a month or two. Um, and then various hookups will, will, you know, changeovers will happen. Um, but not sure the water department will communicate with the affected residents as to, and plenty of time as to when changes will take place. Um, I'm going to, I'll say my piece and then I'll let. I'll let Hannah talk. Um, so I'll skip over the MVP solar project. South County Senior Center moving is going to be moving to a temporary location um, in Sunderland. I believe the location is 22 Amherst Road. Um, it gives the senior center an opportunity to consolidate. Currently, offices are in a separate spot from where the seniors meet. It gives them a chance to sort of consolidate everything into one location. Um, and my understanding is that this is a temporary location um, while other arrangements are in planning are done for um, what would be a, a new uh, permanent location for the senior center. Um, just a reminder, um, veteran uh, names for the Veterans Memorial. Um, there's a deadline for uh, submission of names and also review this is sort of it's actually for review, but I'm sure if someone provided one at this point, they wouldn't uh, turn them away. Um, so this uh, September 16th is sort of the, the final, final, final um, opportunity for people to either review the submissions or, or, or uh, submit someone. Uh, my last one, town hall window um, issue update. And again, this has to do with sort of the, there's an iridescent staining that's happening on some of the storm windows at Town Hall. And um, uh, Julie, Keith, and myself met with um, uh, a consultant who does um, sort of environmental testing of buildings. And they took a, uh, they were able to look at the sample of whatever um, sort of paint material is on the window. And they're gonna test it to see if it's biological in nature. Um, or not. Um, if it's not biological in nature, it's most likely some sort of chemical reaction that's happening. Um, so we'll wait for those results. I also reached out to, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw up the name, but it's essentially the, the, the building sciences department um, and technology at UMass. Um, and I sent some pictures along and I asked if they had any ideas as to, you know, what could be happening with, with these. Um, essentially low E coded windows. Um, and they had various ideas as well. I think once we rule out that it's not biological, so it's not mold or mildew or something else that is growing, um, it's likely something to do with the low E coding film. Um, there's different, they had different theories as to what may be causing it. Uh, I think one of the promising ones is it's likely that there's some sort of delamination happening um, with the window which is allowing, um, which is probably moisture driven. And then once the moisture evaporates from the space, it leaves a void, which, allow, which allows air to come in and then the air oxidizes with the, essentially the metal coating that's, um, you know, that's now exposed to air and it gives it this pink sort of color. Um, and the question is, if that's the case, is it covered under the warranty from the manufacturer, which we would have to, which we will, um, likely say that it is, um, but mm -hmm. that's sort of where we are in the process of investigating, you know, what's happening. So we're working on it, I guess, is my point. Um, and I think Hannah has maybe two updates, maybe two. 
Uh, yeah, so um, for the MVP grant, we had the opportunity to meet with the Energy Committee and Joyce, um, talk about some actions moving forward. Brian and I are still working on um, getting some of our more technical questions answered. Next steps include writing up the RFP to go out to bid for the system. Um, and we're gonna do that after we conduct a little bit more outreach. Um, just checking the agenda. Oh, and the housing production plan. So we've had approximately uh, 47 responses to the community outreach. Um, uh, housing production plan uh, survey. Our next meeting is going to be on October 3rd, I believe, um, wherein we will discuss sections one and two of the draft plan that FERCOG has drafted, as well as discuss um, priorities for uh, increasing housing choices and affordable housing, including zoning changes that might be feasible or desired and identification of specific sites that are town owned and private for affordable housing. Can people still respond to the housing survey or is that closed? I believe it's still open. Is there a deadline for them? No, we're trying to get as many responses as possible. And maybe we can refresh it on the, on the website newsfeed because it's probably dropped a little bit and maybe on Facebook as well. Yeah. I think that's it from the town administrators update. Okay. Um, and just noticing our next meeting is the 27th, which is a Tuesday and October 11th, also a Tuesday. Um, so we're now on the Tuesday schedule for those keeping track at home. Um, any items not anticipated? Okay, I think I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn then. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, all those in favor, Julie? Yes. Uh, Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. All right, good night, everybody. Good night, thank you. Good night, have a good one. You too. You too.